as to where we have an Office of Sustainability where everything public policy that we look at is in terms of environment, economics, and social, and, and really considering that in every decision. Um, part of our electric utility, we're part of four cities that have our generation and transmission operator, which is Platte River Power Authority, and I serve as vice chair uh, of that board. And with the city of Fort Collins, as well as Platte River Power Authority, there's a commitment to 2030 to 100% renewable on the electric side. And that's a considerable statement coming from a uh, uh, Platte River Power Authority, which operates Rawhide Power Plant. And um, next year, we will have 51% of our electric power production coming from renewable resources uh, for these four municipalities. So sustainability, uh, resilience are key. In fact, um, I was on a congressional field hearing in Boulder uh, on the climate crisis and really talking about what Fort Collins is doing specifically around actionable uh, uh, activities that actually uh, address this. And also related to that is, um, you know, our whole commitment to sustainability as a city. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Colorado State University and the partnership we have with Colorado State University being our largest employer and being a uh, platinum uh, sustainable uh, university um, as well is a key to helping to uh, meet those goals. You know, I talk about the climate action and I'd be also remiss if I didn't talk about our natural areas and our natural area programs. So I, I, I heard that you were supposed to go to Soapstone yesterday, but that's a key example of um, the, the Plains to the Mountains uh, transition zone, um, also home to the Lindenmar archeological site. So it's a gem of a resource that will be preserved well, uh, well for the future and uh, uh, serving um, Fort Collins and in the area related to our, our, our natural habitat and, and preserving that uh, for the future. And tomorrow, or uh, we are also dedicating a whitewater park in the Poudre River and so our Poudre River Corridor, which is um, a natural resource in and of itself, where Fort Collins is, is preserving our uh, natural habitat along the corridor, but also for the one stretch uh, where the Whitewater Park is, is actually enabling our community to actually, for the first time, really touch the river and engage with the river in a real way. Also, we've been recognized for the environmental aspects related to the actions along the Poudre River, allowing for the natural flooding events to happen to rejuvenate the habitat and the, the natural environment along the Poudre River as well. And that's all part of a long-term vision to only enhance uh, the corridor along the Poudre River. And uh, with that, I just want to extend my uh, thanks for uh, being able to address you, welcome you to Fort Collins, have a great time, enjoy um, Fort Collins and all it has to offer. Uh, the Max Bus, I guess, which is a key part of this uh, uh, conference and really getting around, that's a, a key aspect to our sustainability as plan as well. So I think uh, in every turn you can see Fort Collins as, as really trying to do something that creates a model for um, a great place to live, but also our commitment to the environment and sustainability uh, for the future. So thank you so much and welcome to Fort Collins. Thank you so much, Mayor and Professor Truxell. So great, as Juliet brings folks up to the stage, um, I'll cut to the chase. So I wanna say that Woody Guthrie's classic song, This Land Is Your Land, has never been more timely as right now. The question, whose land is it anyway? Without doubt, public lands in the US are at a major crossroad and their future is uncertain as ever. So this plenary will definitely be a spirited discussion and I want to say, as with other sessions at SEJ conferences, please, during the plenary, no cheering, no booing, let the plenary begin, and there can be questions later. So with that, I'm really honored to introduce Juliette Alperin. She's the Washington Post Senior National Affairs Correspondent, and she covers how the administration is transforming federal environmental policy and the agencies that oversee it. In fact, she was just reporting, I think, in the Grand Junction, in Grand Junction, and she previously served 
as the White House bureau chief, national environmental reporter, and House of Representatives correspondent. So take it away, Juliet. Thank you. Thanks so much, Susan. Um, so we're really honored to have kind of a, uh, a really diverse and great group of experts up here. Um, so we, to my immediate right, we have Whit Fosberg, who's the president and CEO of the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. Next to him, John Freemuth, who's the Cecil D. Andrus Endowed Chair for the Environment and Public Lands at Boise State University and a CSU alum. At next in line, Shay Loper, who's Director of U.S. Government Relations at Encana Corporation. Then uh, the acting director, of, uh, acting director of the Bureau of Land Management and Deputy Director of Policy and Operations, um, William Perry Penley. And then last but not least, Dina Gilio Whitaker, who works in environmental justice education and policy planning, is a lecturer in American Indian Studies at Cal State San Marcos, and is a member of the Colville Confederated Tribes of Washington State. Um, and so with that, we're going to get right into questions. And I know that there are a lot of folks, including many working journalists in the audience, who have questions to ask. So I will keep that in mind. But uh, for right now, I'm going to start off. I wanted to start with the issue of climate change uh, and, and uh, pose a question to Acting Director Penley and then and have others chime in. It's the position of Interior Secretary Bernhardt that human activities are helping drive climate change and barring a new law, the legal obligation that the department has to address it involves having an individual work on a regular assessment of this issue through the energy department. And, but there's a separate question of how climate change is affecting the lands that the Interior Department as a whole manages and specifically BLM manages as it does more than 10% of America's land. So Acting Director Penley, I was hoping you could talk about when, when you have been uh, on this job assessing what the impact of climate change is to the lands under your portfolio. Can you talk about what, you know, what you've been briefed on by your scientists, what you see as, as the, these lands are facing, and how you intend to address it? Thanks. Uh, well, the Secretary has uh, spoken often on this subject. Uh, I'm not a scientist. I'm a lawyer. And uh, I defer to the Secretary. He's been very clear on this subject. Uh, he believes that uh, their climate change is real, that mankind has an impact, uh, that we're unable to forecast uh, future climate conditions, uh, but uh, we need to understand the consequences and address the consequences of uh, future climate conditions. Uh, we are, uh, the Secretary's made the point often that there are a lot of shalls in the laws that direct the Secretary to do his job. He shall do this under the Endangered Species Act. He shall do this under the uh, Federal Land Policy and Management Act. Uh, but uh, there is no shall for the Secretary with regard to the issue of climate change. He's been uh, quite clear on this. Nonetheless, the courts have instructed us uh, that when we prepare these environmental impact statements, when we seek to comply with the National Environmental Policy Act, we are required to, as the law says, take a hard look at the impacts of whatever it is we're planning to do, whether it's building a solar plant, uh, authorize a, a wind power plant, uh, uh, authorize oil and gas development, or even recreational activities, we've got to take that hard look. And so we're working with our scientists at the U.S. Geological Survey and elsewhere throughout the department. We're relying on our career officials uh, to advise us uh, on uh, NEPA document by NEPA document as to, okay, what is the impact uh, what are the greenhouse gases situation? Uh, and at the end of the at the end of the discussion, to allow us to make a decision to move forward. Uh, so we're guided by our scientists. We're guided by our experts. Uh, we're preparing documents that will uh, seek to inform the American people on which we receive comments and and then move forward uh, with a decision that benefits the American people, that complies with the law, and that fulfills uh, the obligation uh, given us by Congress. Okay, Shay uh, Liver, I'd like to to move to you for a moment because that, that actually the acting director spoke to litigation. I'm going to come back to climate impacts, but wh why don't we talk about litigation since that's uh, what he br brought up. So clearly we're, we're um, as he alluded to, there's, there's been a number of lawsuits pressing 
the Interior Department and, uh, and obviously some of its agencies and bureaus specifically to analyze the greenhouse gas impact of, of its operations. And, and you know, obviously this has a huge impact on leases. We've seen federal decisions like in Wyoming suspending leases, as well as you know, there was just a lawsuit filed just a couple of days ago challenging a management plan for the area in western Col Colorado surrounding Grand Junction. Um, when I was wondering, when you look at this landscape of, of kind of an increasingly fraught court battle over to what extent the federal government needs to account for the climate impact of its leasing decisions, what does that mean for Encana and, and the industry as a whole? And you know. uh, I mean, it is <coughs> certainly uh, something that we look at in our planning stages, um, but uh, you know, litigation is certainly nothing new uh, for for industry as it approaches any type of development. You look at the sage grouse, that's been litigated for 10 to 15 years. Uh, you look at the Clean Water Act at WOTUS, you know, that's been under substantial litigation for, for a long period of time. So it's something that we look at uh, and that we follow and that we engage on. Um, and, and I think what we're ultimately looking for is greater certainty so that we, that we can plan our operations and plan our investments. Um, and, and also to have a positive role in the process. Uh, as, the, as the acting director said, you know, there is substantial public process in all of these decisions on federal lands. Uh, you have a resource management plan that takes five, 10 years to develop that has public stakeholder input. Uh, when it comes to a lease sale, you have another round of, of environmental review and public comment. Uh, and, and when it comes to a, an individual permit, um, we, we certainly also go through a process um, that, that includes environmental review and assessment uh, to, to mitigate and to best address uh, all of the different factors, whether, whether wildlife, whether, whether climate, uh, in, the, in the operational decisions and in the conditions of that individual permit. And so when you speak of greater certainty, in other words, you know, and I've, again, heard kind of mixed things from industry about how they feel about the current approach that the federal government takes to calculating the climate impact of leasing. Would it just be easier for oil and gas companies if, as a general rule, regardless of what state you're talking about, the BLM calculated every time it did a lease plan, every time it did a sale, what are the greenhouse gas emissions of both these operations and the the fossil fuels that would be burned, would that make life easier for industry? Well, and, and I, I think we also spend a, quite a bit of, I mean, we have our file, our annual filings that we have to do on our greenhouse gas emissions. I, I think the the biggest thing is just to make, make develop a system that makes fundamental sense. Um, you know, the Bureau of Land Management is not, a, a, I will defer to the acting director on this, but I don't think they have climate specialists on staff. Um, and so how, how do you develop a system that, that appropriately contemplates those impacts um, while, while not um, uh, it, it distracting from some of the, their primary goals and objectives, utilize the expertise that's out there and develop a system that's, that's functional and, and makes common sense in how you assess those impacts mm -hmm. uh, and utilize, I, I think he referenced USGS, you know, utilize the resources that, that, that are in play. Um, uh, so I, I think let's just, let's take a common sense approach and recognize that uh, under NEPA, you know, it's a snapshot in time. That analysis represents uh, that moment in time. So how do, you, how do you contemplate that in that immediate decision? So. Got it. Julie, could I interject here? Sure. I mean, you, you, you talk about certainty. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, I could talk about certainty from the standpoint of the federal government. He mm -hmm. could talk about certainty from the standpoint of industry. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's another people that we're talking about left out of the equation. You talk about oil and gas on the western slope of Colorado, mm -hmm. rural Colorado, which is hard hit economically. And the development of these resources is the life's blood for these people. I mean, uh, the, the most important environment for most people is do they have a home, can they provide fuel, and they, can they provide food, can they provide uh, the, the, the wherewithal for their families, and that means jobs. And the BLM and industry, uh, whether it's recreational industry or it's the oil and gas industry, provide those jobs. And, and when we get involved in litigation, lawyers like us say, well, you know, it's the cost of doing business. The industry says it's the cost of doing business. But at the end of the day, for the local community, it's life or death. 
is, is that company going to be op able to open up? We just had a closure on the western slope of an, a big office. Uh, that's a big blow to a western community. And so when we can say, yes, we're going to open up that project. Yes, we're going to have that, uh, that facility going. And that, that will mean jobs. You can pay for your schools. You can pay for the hospitals. You can pay for law enforcement and, uh, and, and return revenue to the state and local government. And so uh, that's the certainty that we, we'd like to deliver on. Thanks, and I'd like to pivot off that question to Professor um, Julia Whitaker. So again, the deputy director, the acting director just made a reference to the idea that it's kind of life or death for these communities to have energy projects green-lighted. Um, could you give your perspective as someone who obviously spends your time working with communities out west of what you see as, as some of the, you know, how, how they view this issue and, and what, are, what are some of the top concerns you hear when you're, when you're working on these issues? Okay, um, before I answer that question, why peace nuxil ku isquis dina Julia Whitaker, I want to do a proper acknowledgement of the indigenous people, the ancestors of this land, the Arapaho Cheyenne, and others who um, were here for since time immemorial. So um, that's just a traditional way that we as native people um, introduce ourselves. So um, I think the concept of life and death is kind of a different issue for Native people. Um, when when um, the acting director mentioned life, life, the lifeblood of the oil and gas industry, it's referring to economic, like an economic framework. It's about um, how families support themselves, and, and not that that's not an issue for Native people, because obviously it is. But the fact is that for Native people, um, Native people have always been in the front lines of, um, of climate change, of environmental disruption. Um, our lives today are shaped by these histories of environmental disruption. And, um, and, and it is a literally a life and death situation. It's um, about how um, processes of development have historically um, impacted our communities. We could look at the history of uranium mining for the biggest and best example of that. Um, we also, um, and that's, that's still a very immediate concern. Um, in terms of oil and gas, um, we have, um, a, you know, m several and, you know, quite a few tribes who are um, fossil fuel developing tribes. And so these projects are Im economically important. It's meant the, di the difference between dire poverty and, you know, um, d very deep and long-lasting poverty to, um, to having, have, you know, being, being able to develop a life of dignity. Um, but there's been a cost with that. It's been what I call a Faustian bargain for, for tribal nations who, who are um, going in that direction. And there are huge impacts to the land, to their reservation communities, but there are also huge social impacts. And um, uh, all we need to do is talk about the, the problem of missing and murdered indigenous women. This, this, that is um, deeply connected to um, the issue of um, fossil fuel development around these man camps that we hear um, about in some of these communities. Um, and th this is um, directly connected to um, women being exploited to um, this, you know, sex trade, human trafficking, all that kind of stuff. So this is a multi-layered problem for Native people. And it's, it's very vexed. It's very, very complex. Got it. And I was hoping our other two panelists, um, with Fosberg and John Freemuth, could you comment when you look at this landscape, there's obviously a very active debate going on right now about you know, the, the Trump administration's advancement of what is termed energy dominance and what the implications are of that for, you know, again, local communities in terms of the operations of the government itself, the federal budget. Um, you know, state economies. What, what's your what's your sense of how you know what we've seen as certainly a, a significant shift from the previous administration is is playing out out here in the West? Yeah. So uh, let me weigh in on this one. Our organization is a coalition of national hunting and fishing conservation organizations, range from Ducks Unlimited, Mule Deer Foundation, Outdoor Industry Association, AFL CIO. Um, our mission is to guarantee that all Americans have quality places to hunt and fish. And we talk about things like climate change. I mean, our guys are on the front line. Elk are coming out of the mountains later. Duck migrations are significantly later. You know, Minnesota's not gonna have a moose season this year because the moose are all being killed by ticks. 
They're not being killed because, because ticks are not dying. It's not getting cold enough anymore. You know, so you can talk about you know, all the impacts out there. I think our guys see it very well. But I mean, I think our, the sportsman's community has largely been that kind of sensible center traditionally. And I think that you know, what we're seeing right now is a real lack of leadership in terms of from this administration uh, in terms of sensible solutions on this. We can disagree on how you're going to reduce emissions, but we can all agree you need to. And energy needs to be a part of, in, energy industry has to be a part of this too because you know, we ought to be capturing methane. We should not be flaring that off. We ought to be consolidating you know, pads and roads, which are good for surface impacts, but it's also good for reducing that carbon footprint in the development. We also have to make a commensurate investment on the land. I mean, you don't have to go very far outside of Fort Collins to see you know, huge swaths of national forests that are dead from pine beetle infestation. Now, to the extent that we can go in and we can do reforestation, we can put more agricultural lands into conservation, we can develop coastal wetlands for coastal resiliency, those are great things for carbon sequestration, they're great things for fish and wildlife, they're great for communities, they're great for farming industry right now, which is in a world of hurt, and, uh, but we're not seeing that sort of leadership. Instead, we get polarized into these you know, energy dominance, which by definition means that everything else is subservient to energy development on public lands. Now, Secretary Bernhardt, to his credit, you won't hear him use that terminology anymore because he recognizes that's not the law that BLM and the rest of the federal agencies have to abide by. You know, they have to practice true multiple use, which means hunting, fishing, energy development, mining, grazing, right, hiking, biking, all have to coexist in an intelligent way on a lot of our public lands. So I think that that's where we've really seen a lack of leadership is in coming up with those you know, sensible solutions and instead pivoting toward the extremes on the debate on both sides, which I don't really think help anybody on this one. Yeah, Julia, uh, if you look at this one way, the, the tension between use versus preservation of our public lands is historic. It's 100 years old, and we're, we always do that. But what I think has changed a little bit is in this context, we now have the agencies having to also deal with things like take the Park Service, for example, they now have to water the giant sequoias in the Sierra Nevada because of changes in temperature and precipitation to keep those trees alive. So the context of the battle has changed over time. The other part of it, is, of course, is we tend to do assume certainty in all of that. Administrations changed. They wanted to emphasize one thing over another. But was it was it was it within stable parameters? Now there is no certainty to me as these policy switches go back and forth constantly. I'll give you one example. You're probably going to address it later. When we talk about things like this, the president have the authority, the current president, to reduce the size of the bears ears, which is sacred to many American tribes, and grand staircase. What's to stop the next president from? Re reinstating those boundaries again. Are we entering into that kind of policy shift where we whipsaw the agencies and all of us back and forth because we can't find grounds, as, as Witt says, in the middle to talk about these issues? Yeah, we'll disagree, but these switches just don't do anybody any good, including the folks who have to take care of these lands on the ground all the time. Got it. And and Director Penley, I want to just circle back on one question, which was actually what I asked at first. But you, you, you were talking, and I appreciate that, about uh, to what extent the, administ the administration looks at the emissions. What I, one thing I'm interested in, which we've just heard a, a few of our panelists talk about, is there are climate impacts happening on public lands right now, including many of the BLM lands that you manage. And can you talk a little about, you know, there was, in other words, a number of policies that that were obviously enacted under the previous administration where they were going about analyzing it, you know, taking certain actions to, to deal with climate impacts. To what extent is that work still going on within the BLM? Can you talk a little about when you look at how climate change is affecting the public lands that so many Americans use, what, what is the administration doing when it, when it looks at those impacts? And what do you see as for potentially uh, are, are there serious impacts from your perspective? Are there not major climate impacts on BLM lands at this point? Well, I, I've not been briefed. I got here on July 16th. Uh, I've not been briefed by uh, our, our state directors and our other BLM experts with regard to impacts on their resources, the resources they manage uh, from climate change. Uh, I would anticipate that uh, I might be briefed at some time in the future on those subjects. And, uh, 
but I take it a case at a time as the issues are brought to me, uh, uh, as proposals are brought in to be forwarded to the secretary to make a decision on, and we analyze uh, uh, in accordance with uh, what the courts ask us to do, and, uh, and move forward. Perfect. I want to ask one question about uh, the Democratic presidential field, which is obviously moving in a radically different direction on, on this issue. And particularly one thing that I'm struck by as someone who's covered politics in the past is that you have the vast majority, the both you know, a number of major outlets, including the New York Times and the Washington Post, have trackers on policy positions of presidential candidates. And when I when I worked on our climate tra our, our uh, you know tracker that we did. The policy position I was struck by as the greatest change among Democratic presidential candidates is the vast majority of them, with actually the exceptions of a couple Coloradans, um, was uh, a quote unquote keep it in the ground approach. In other words, you have you know, something like two thirds of the Democrats who are running for president of the United States have pledged to stop all new fossil fuel leasing from public lands and public waters. And I'm really interested in what folks on the panel think of that position, which obviously would be a sharp departure from any administration in United States history, and also, of course, raises some real le legal questions. Um, I'd be interested in hearing the, what folks think in terms of the pros and cons. Well, I'll jump, in. I'll right. jump in. Uh, and I think you answered your own question uh, with, your an with your question. Uh, who opposed that? The Colorado members because they understand uh, such a policy uh, would be absolutely devastating. It would be absolutely devastating, not just to the American West, but to the entire country. Uh, a tremendous amount of the energy we use every day, whether it's gasoline or uh, natural gas, uh, oil, uh, comes from federal lands. Uh, I'm uh, on behalf of the Bureau of Land Management, uh, but there's another agency at the Department of the Interior that handles the Outer Continental Shelf. And the overwhelming majority of the oil and gas we use in our nation comes from the Outer Continental Shelf under programs started by Ronald Reagan. And to, to say, leave that in the ground, uh, frankly, I, I can give no other word for it than absolutely insane. And, and a terrible blow to the American people, to the West, uh, and, uh, and we'll see how that stands up. I'm, I'm, I, I think uh, if the, they're sincere about it, they ought to bring it for a vote in Congress. Uh, and let's see where people stand on that issue, uh, because I think the overwhelming majority of the American people would vote against it. So we'll see how those uh, policies play out next year. Got it. Professor Freeman, yeah, and, then, and then Professor Freeman. Yeah, this cuts a couple of ways. Number one, I'll, I'll state what Mr. Penley said a little differently. It does enhance the t rural urban divide even more, w uh, because uh, so the West is a very rural urban divide part of the country. And when local folks hear that kind of general statement, it, it, it's probably going to turn a lot of them off. And in basic politics, I don't know what that's going to mean in terms of the election. But it cuts another way when you do see certain coastal states being opposed to acceleration of leasing on their, near their shores, fears of spills. And then it brings up the great federalism question. Wait, this is an administration that's supposed to be taking it back to the home folks and states. And when states say no, all of a sudden, and this is not unique to, this is not a political comment. States push back and say, well, wait a minute. Isn't your rhetoric about federalism? And yet this is top down telling us what to do. So this thing cuts a couple of ways. Got it. Yeah, I agree. Good. That's a really important point. And as somebody who lives in the state of California, was born and raised, I live in the coastal region, um, I can tell you that the people of California are d deeply, deeply opposed to offshore oil drilling. It's the same as with the state, of the, as my, to my knowledge, the people in the states of Oregon and Washington as well. Um, these are, um, these are going to be tough battles for the federal government to win. Um, they have to, there are rules that have to, um, all, have to be overcome. I mean, there's certain jurisdictional issues that the state does have power over within the first three miles of the offshore area. So um, while six miles out, the federal government may have jurisdictional power out there, those, there's those three miles between um, the coast and that, that the, the three miles that extend out that um, you know, are going to have to be negotiated with the state because that's that's their um, power. But 
in California, our coasts are a huge economic driver. And all we need to do is look back at the, the oil spill in Santa Barbara of 1969 to see how devastating that was. And um, you know, even now, if something like that happened, it would, it would be incalculable um, if we had some kind of massive oil spill um, again or some kind of environmental disaster. Then, uh, does anyone else have thoughts they want to share on that issue? Or I'll go on. OK. Um, so one of the things that I'm very interested in whenever I write about public lands issues is kind of who has a say, and do some people have more of a say than others? And so I wanted to dig in a little deeper to these questions. And for context, I wanted to read um, uh, to the acting director a, a comment that, uh, that I believe you made in the 1990s um, uh, when it came to describing environmentalist view of the West. This was in the context of a fight in Idaho over what sort of restrictions uh, should have been put on the Oahe River. Uh, and so this is uh, what it was. Uh, it was characterized as, in their vision, everything from the 100th Meridian to the Cascade Range becomes a vast park through which they might drive, drinking their Perrier and munching their organic chips, staying occasionally in the bed and breakfast operations into which the homes of Westerners have been turned, with those Westerners who remain fluffing duvets and pouring cappuccino. And I was interested, to what extent is this still your vision of outdoor tourism? And do you think that non-Westerners should have, more, have, have less of a say than Westerners in terms of what happens to the public lands? Well, uh, you're right. I'm acting director of the Bureau of Land Management and proud to be there. Uh, and uh, we manage 245 million acres of land, 10% uh, of the nation's land mass. Uh, and we have a true manage, uh, multiple use directive. Uh, we are the most diverse agency in all the federal government, not just interior, all of the federal government. We drill for oil, uh, we mine coal, we cut trees, we allow ranchers to graze their cattle and their sheep on our lands, uh, your lands, uh, and at the same time we open up our lands to recreational activities. Uh, I was blessed with the opportunity when I first got to the department to sign off on three initiatives to increase recreational access uh, to the BLM lands. Uh, we acquired the Jupiter Lighthouse in Florida, uh, 13,000 acres along the Blackfoot River in Montana for stream access, 10,000, 11,000 acres along the John Day River uh, to uh, increase access. And so that's important recreational opportunities uh, for the people of the West. And I know those communities that have those opportunities are delighted to have them, and I'm excited to play a role in making sure that they have those opportunities. Professor Julio, it's here. also been a, a ma major obstacle to tribal communities in um, their ability to practice their their um, tribal religions and spiritual ways. So there there is really, um, I mean, we have uh, legal precedents that have been handed down by the Supreme Court um, that have been huge impediments to Native people being able to go out and um, have have access to their sacred places on public lands in ways that um, are, are um, protect their ability to have like, I mean, there, there's access, access is allowed, but as the Ling case and the Go, the Go Road case in 1988 uh, made really clear, it's that um, we're, while it wasn't an impediment to, you know, there wasn't an infringement about native right to practice religion, it severely um, impeded with the quality of the ability to use that when there's, um, you know, logging equipment and, you know, all kinds of disruption. There's just not a respect. There's not a respect um, inherent in tribal law or in um, federal law for tribes to be able to, and this is one of the huge problems for Indian country right now. We don't have um, any kind of meaningful um, guarantees and protections to be able to use these lands with, where so much of these sacred sites are still located. So this is something that has to, is gonna have to be dealt with in the future. It's gonna have to come up. That's why I argue it's an environmental justice issue for Native people. Professor Freeman? Yeah, I'm wearing a t-shirt that says public land owner. Maybe some of you have it. I, it's too cold to expose it. <laughs> but I want to tell you a quick story with some levity to illustrate this local national tension. It's said with respect for the names involved, but it's also funny. 
when the Bundy brothers occupied the Malheur Refuge, that's about 120 miles from Boise. Please come next year, you'll like Boise. <laughs> I got a call from two guys, talk show in Philly. It wasn't NPR, just two guys, the Eagles fans, we were having fun. And he said, our listeners don't understand why those ranchers are so mad, pardon this though, at Black Lives Matter. And I went, what? Well, the BLM. And I said, <laughs> No, this is true. I said, Bureau of Land Management. At which point, who are they? <laughs> so, what, they are national lands, national public lands. But how many of you really know much about BLM? We in the West do, but this is part of our problem as we try to work through these issues. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think there's definitely not all jobs are created equal in the mind of you know, certain people. I mean, you think about the Outdoor industry is assessment of the outdoor industry, the outdoor recreation economy, $887 billion a year. BEA has a somewhere north of $700 billion a year, second or third largest economic sector in this country. Yet, you know, when you know, Director Penley you know, mentions like all the jobs at stake in western Colorado, which I agree with, I mean, some of those towns you know, are very dependent on oil and gas and you know, what happens there matters. You know, conspicuously, there was no mention of all the, you know, the hunting, the guiding, the biking, all the other outdoor businesses that also depend on those public lands. And when they're developed with a single use in mind, like we saw with, you know, when the oil and gas fields in Pinedale were developed in the 2000s and it collapsed the mule deer herd, you know, I mean, and all of a sudden tags were reduced by a large amount, you know, guiding operations went out of business. I mean, we didn't hear the stories about that. So, I mean, there is more than just oil and gas communities in the West that depend upon actually balanced, you know, recreation, development, you know, whatever it is, policies. But you really only hear about, you know, sort of the poor oil and gas guys or the poor grazers that may lose their job if X or Y happens. You don't hear about the entire outdoor recreation economy, which honestly didn't really exist 40 years ago, but is huge today. And uh, so I just think the thing has changed, but a lot of mindsets within our public land agencies has not changed yet. Or tribal treaty rights. Sorry, Mr. Lover, do you want to uh, I would, in here? I mean, I jump in. kind of building off that, you know, I do think... Um, I mean, the, the statute is all about multiple use, right? And it's about building consensus and working together to, to arrive at the best land management practices and policies that make sense and, and, and bring together all sides. You know, our, our employees live and work in these communities. They are vital parts of these communities. You know, when we, I know we've, we've had folks that are part of the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. They're, they're active in those environmental, or those local environmental organizations those local outdoorsmen or organizations. Um, and we as a company try to partner partner with those organizations in those communities because they're they're so important. Uh, and and speaking to the to the tribal front as well, when we're we we are um, in Wyoming, we're we're on the reservation, the Wind River Reservation with the northern Arapaho and eastern Shoshone. We're we're uh, in Utah, we're uh, on the in the Uinta Basin, we're on the, the Ute Indian tribe. Um, we work closely with those tribes and build those relations completely outside of the federal government and any sort of restrictions or parameters there because building that trust and having that dialogue is so important and we approach it, it it's a core priority for us um, to approach uh, the, the tribes with respect, uh, to be open, transparent, and honest uh, and do all of that regardless of administration and regard, regardless of, part, of political party. Um, so I, that's a long-winded way of saying, you know, I, 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 there, it must be consensus-driven. There's a process for it to be consensus-driven, and, and that's the process we, we should follow. And I just wanted to, to just press a little harder on one point, which is that in terms of should there be a hierarchy in who has say over what happens to public lands, meaning as uh, Professor Freemuth pointed out, we are all owners of public lands, but for example, you know, should tribes who have historic claims, should they have a greater say on what happens to some of these public lands? Should Do Westerners, do people who live closest to those communities, should their views be elevated above others if there's, you know, a million people who write in and, you know, a small handful is from Panguitch or, you know, areas around Grand Staircase Escalante, but, you know, there's an overwhelming, you know, input from those who might want to visit 
you know, one of these national monuments, but doesn't live there. Does anyone just have any thoughts they'd want on say on that? Well, personally, I do think I'm going to say it. I do think tribes should have priority. I think sh tribes should have. Look, most of these lands were taken illegally to begin with. Some of these lands were taken by treaty, uh, treaties with guns to the head of tribal leaders at, in very desperate times. You had a massive land grab during the Dawes years, during the assimilation. Two-thirds of all treaty lands were lost through, through allotment and absorption through the federal government. So, you know, we need, these are, there's major structural issues um, that, that structure the United States relationship with tribal nations that are based on uh, profound injustice. And so how do we talk about balancing out those relationships of injustice? Um, and I'm, I'll say further that um, the legal system is the problem. We can talk, you know, talk about defer to the laws and all this, but it's the legal system that's the problem. It's the, the structure of um, settler colonialism is a system of domination. And um, this is what's not talked about um, enough. It's the elephant in the living room in this country. Professor Fimak. The general answer to that question is no, no one should have special credence, but be informed. But I agree with, with the last speaker. I always tell students when we talk about national parks and wilderness and untouched, primitive, pristine America, no, there were people here with cultures. And so I don't know how to uh, uh, piece through the role of the tribes, but I know there's something there that's different and special in the conversation, and I'll leave it there. But generally, nobody has a special voice, but be informed. Director Penley. Uh, my, uh, my old friend Reeves Brown, uh, Colorado, and former head of the uh, uh, Colorado Cattlemen's Association, once said, uh, 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 a, uh, a chicken is interested in what you have for breakfast, but a pig is affected. And uh, there are a lot of people interested in what's going on. on it took a while, eh? Uh, <laughs> Sorry, right. it took a while. More the, uh, by dinner, but the point the point is, there's uh, millions of people in America that are interested, uh, in a way, uh, about what's happened out west or what's going on out west. But I can tell you, the people that are affected by it, the people live there, and what everybody wants to do, what everybody dreams about doing, is having a job, being able to provide for their families, uh, being able in the local community to have. Uh, hospitals and schools and law enforcement and dream that meant one day their kids might be able to have a job and come back and live uh, close to them and raise their kids there, uh, their grandkids. Uh, and so that's, that's one of the challenges. But as a director of the BLM, uh, we're guided, and as a lawyer, we're guided by the law, uh, what Congress decides. Um, you know, uh, we can't say the president can't say, the secretary can't say, I certainly can't say what we're going to do. Congress has already told us what to do. It's already told us what we're allowed to do, and the Supreme Court provides guidance as to how those laws are to be interpreted. And at the end of the day, that's, those are our marching orders. And so we can only go so far as that allows. Uh, nobody has priority. We're told how we're supposed to do these things, and, uh, make, and we try to make the wisest decisions uh, we can. I, I do want to interject something that was mentioned earlier. Uh, I can tell you, because uh, I've known him a long time, that Secretary Bernhardt is not a Johnny-come-lately to the hunting, fishing, uh, backpacking outdoors community. He's been a longtime supporter of that uh, 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 element of our uh, country and the interest they have in federal lands. He has uh, been uh, uh, employed by the Department of Interior longer than any other job he's ever had, and uh, he knows about the agency and what it is allowed to do. Okay, do you want to briefly respond? And then I yeah, I mean, I think that I would actually agree with your comments about you know, Secretary Bernhardt, who has been, I think, pretty fair on most of these issues for the last. In terms of prioritization, I think it really goes back to what we talked to when you were talking about in terms of you know, balance in this area. I mean, and Colorado's own Ken Salazar, when he was secretary, put together something called mass release planning. But the idea being, before you go into an area and open up for oil and gas development, you go in and you look at that big area and you figure out where you're going to do development, where you're going to site roads, where you're going to put pipelines, where you're going to protect, where are the special species areas. And you do that before you develop. And you bring all the stakeholders in to comment on that, and then that guides you. So it really becomes a way where you can have your cake and eat it too. You can accommodate a whole bunch of uses. You don't have to prioritize one over the other. Maybe in certain areas, yeah. But in a big landscape, no. And you know, Congress threw that out in the first days of the 
Trump administration because it had been done by the Obama administration. But going back to you know, Director Penley's comments, I think that you, know, you guys have the authority to be creative in how you develop, how you balance those things. You don't have to have an exact edict from Congress about mass release planning or anything like that. I mean, that's why you guys have the job. Think creatively, bring these stakeholders together, and don't pit one side against the other in areas where you don't have to. Okay, and well, I'm going to ask two let, more questions. Let me, right. let me give a specific Very example quickly. and make the point, and I'll be quick. Super We're quick. going to have an oil and gas leasing sale in Colorado. The governor came to our state director, Jamie Connell, and, she, and, and the governor said, we got wildlife corridors, your oil and gas plants interfere with that. Can we defer some of those? And Jamie immediately recommended to me, well, let's defer those tracks. The governor's opposed to those tracks because they interfere with his wildlife corridors. And we said, aye, aye, sir. And we've removed those tracks. So we can do it, and we have done it. All right, moving on. I'm just going to ask two quick more questions, and then we're going to open it up for all the journalists in the audience. Uh, Professor Freemuth, you recently testified before the Natu House Natural Resources Committee, uh, referring to, sorry, I should say that one of the obviously biggest changes we've seen is this push to relocate almost all of BLM's remaining DC staff out west. And in response, and uh, commenting on that reorganization, you said if the BLM directorate is not in Washington, it will be much less likely to take part of the decision, referring to all the key, you know, yeah. final decisions. Yes. Can you explain what you meant by that? Yeah, there are. BLM is fairly decentralized, really decentralized. It's organized by state. Our other federal agencies are not. They are organized by region. All right. So with that said, there are decisions that are national decisions for BLM, sage grouse, things like that. And if those decisions require interagency collaboration and discussion, along with resource professionals, and those people are not in Washington, and the decision is still in Washington, then BLM is not in the conversation. The old saw is if, you're in, if there's a big dinner party and you're invite, not invited, then you're probably on the menu. They need to be there for those kind of issues. Otherwise, most of the decisions are made in the state. Got it. Um, did, would anyone else like to comment on the decision to move most of BLM out west and its implications? I'd like to speak in favor. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I think it makes all the sense in the world, 97. Can you speak specifically to the professor's point that basically if you don't have the top BLM well, officials, with the exception of yourself, since you're staying um, in Washington, that, that the, you simply won't have the same level of both coordination and input well, that you would uh, have when people are physically in the same room speaking to answer the Answer it quickly and then in a somewhat light length. I'm not, going to be anybody, I'm not going to be on anybody's menu. Uh, but the bottom line is that the people we're working with are out in the field too. We're working with a local forest ranger. Uh, we're lurk working with the Department of Defense that may have a facility out there. Uh, we're working with the Bureau of Reclamation. We're working with tribal leaders. And that's where we need to be, out there where the decisions aren't really made in Washington. The Chief of the Forest Service isn't deciding about the Tongass National Forest. Chief of the, for the Regional Forester is making those decisions and we're, we're out there working with that leader. Um, and then just uh, one last question, then we're opening it up. Um, Director Penley, you're, you're headed to the border next week to look at the um, 560 acres of land spanning 70 miles of border that BLM has transferred at, temporarily, as I understand it, to the Army um, for, you know, for purposes of the construction of the border wall there. Could you talk about what analysis went into that decision? What did the BLM assess would be the impact of doing uh, you know, construction along this area, its impact on whether it's wildlife corridors or other resources within that area? Well, I'm going to a different location and maybe some of the same locations, but I can tell you the Secretary of the Interior made a personal visit uh, to those lands. Uh, he made that in the company with his two state directors, the two state directors for BLM, once again, career employees. And I'll tell you what, uh, everybody's talking about illegal immigration and talking about the border situation. Uh, we're tunnel focused, uh, laser focused on one issue. What is the impact of uh, unfettered immigration across our, our borders on BLM lands? Our obligation is to protect those lands, protect their quality, protect the vegetation, protect endangered species there, and, and so forth. And so I know what the secretary did when he went out there on the ground was see, with the help of his state directors, what, what's been the impact uh, there. 
And that's my, what I'll be doing when I go to Southern California, I'll be walking the border with our, our state director and to see, uh, assess what's the impact there so I can report back to the White House and the president about uh, his future plans on constructing a, a border barrier. And it is fair to say that the department determined that the impact of illegal border crossings was having more of a disproportionate effect on those lands than say any, any other impacts of, of switching That was the, the secretary's border. conclusion. Got it. Anyone else want to speak to that at all or no? Okay, let's open it up for questions. I'm going to start. And by the way, I want to, I think you all know this, but I want to emphasize that working journalists are the folks who have the right to ask questions first. If we have other, and I, we've instructed the folks and members, we've instructed the folks at the mics to be aware of this. So please, please, working journalists and members are the ones who are asking questions first. Thank you, and be brief and don't speechify. Okay. Starting with you, sir. Thank and you. please identify yourself. Yes, I'm Tim Wheeler. I'm uh, with the Bay Journal. That's the Chesapeake Bay Journal. Uh, I'm also the chairman of uh, SCJ's Freedom of Information Task Force. And uh, uh, this question is for Mr. Penley. Um, I wanted to ask a question, not a substance question, but one about policy and, and, uh, and law and about freedom of information. And it's basically about why you're making it so much harder for us to do our jobs and for the public to, uh, to be informed about what its government is doing. Reporters are telling me that they're having difficulty, that they cannot get interviews with staff, uh, and that they can't get questions answered in a timely fashion. Uh, they can't get interviews, certainly without going through PIOs. And the PIOs are telling me that they can't grant interviews or answer questions from national media or on controversial topics without those getting approved by political appointees or their designates. Yours is not the first administration to practice this kind of censorship by PIO, but it certainly has carried it to a farther extreme. My question to you is, do you have a written policy or guideline or regulation that limits or restricts employees from speaking to the press? And if so, is there discipline if they do so? And if you can't answer that question, will you bring it back to the headquarters and get us answers to that? And if there is that kind of a policy, what's the justification for it? Uh, there is no such policy. I'm, I'm not going to uh, grant your uh, assertions. Uh, I spent an hour last night with a reporter from Bloomberg News. I spent an hour this morning with Juliet. I've got an afternoon full of interviews from reporters. Uh, I answer questions every day from the media uh, that come in via email. Uh, we are responding as quickly as possible to all the FOIA requests. Uh, our, our solicitor at the department testified before the Senate Natural or the House Natural Resources Committee, and I think he fully answered all the questions that were asserted uh, in the vein of yours uh, that we're not being responsive, we're not complying with the law, and we're interfering politically uh, with regard to our obligations under the Freedom of Information Act. So, sir, I just disagree. Well, if I may, just one quick follow-up. You're just one, you're a political appointee. I'm talking about the thousands of employees out there who are actually carrying out the work on the ground and they are not allowed to speak to the press. Okay, wait. Ambassador Freeman wants to Real quick, uh, this is not just a BLM issue, it's an interior issue. I know for a fact that Park Service superintendents concerned with certain issues, perhaps with BLM and a development too close to the boundaries, are now not allowed to do comments. That has to go up to Washington to be looked at. So this may be more a department-wide issue than something particular to one agency. Julia, yeah. nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Uh, we have on our website and the BLM website regarding our move, we have an FAQ up for all our employees. So they can send us a question about the move so we can answer their questions. One of the questions was, do I still have the ability to contact my senator or congressman to give him my views on the move? And our answer was, we will not interfere with your constitutional rights to exercise your First Amendment rights of speech or to seek redress of grievances. And that's absolutely our position. So if employees want to talk to the media, uh, hey, I got a send button uh, on my computer, and every time I hit send, it ends up at E&E. And I, I don't know how that happens, uh, but apparently our employees are not constrained uh, with regard to communicating with y'all. Excellent. Moving on to the next question over there. Thank you. Um, my name is Jacob Holzman, reporter with CQ Roll Call. 
Um, my question is for Mr. Penley. It's fairly specific. What are your thoughts on the on the roughly one million acre mineral withdrawal near the Grand Canyon? Do you think it should stay or it should go? I'm recused on that subject. Does anyone else want to on the panel weigh in on that particular issue by any chance? If not, let's move on to the next question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for being here. This is a question for Mr. Penley. My Please name, identify yourself. My name is Jimmy Tobias. I'm an independent reporter. Um, unfortunately, in August, I had to sue your agency for its complete lack of response to my Freedom of Information Act request, and you just brought this subject up, and so did Tim. I've, in the last few months, I've filed a bunch of FOIA requests for your calendars, your emails, and other things related to your activities at the department, and I don't want to have to sue again because it's a waste of everyone's time and resources, and I'm just wondering, what are your plans to improve transparency at the agency? What are your plans to start responding to FOIA requests in a timely manner as required by the law? Well, we have a process, and uh, there are others fulfilling that process. Uh, anybody who knocks on my door, any employee knocks on my door and say, Perry, we got an FOI request for this, that, or the other, I step back and let them have at it. And nobody's knocked on my door yet, and when they do, uh, they're going to have access to my materials. And frankly, I know that uh, everything on my computer subject to FOIA can be accessed by department uh, people, uh, career people, and uh, uh, when that time comes and they want to respond, then they'll do it. Okay, thanks. Let's go to the next. Uh, Chris D'Angelo with HuffPost. This is also for Mr. Penley. You mentioned, <laughs> you mentioned the, uh, the importance of protecting public lands. Earlier this year, the BLM scrubbed stewardship language from its news releases specific to protecting land for future gen generations. I'm just wondering if you're aware of that and if you can explain the decision there. Earlier this year, can you tell me when, sir? Um, in the summer, I think, July. I'm thinking it was before I got there. So, no, so no, I don't know. I can't. I can't respond to your question. I'm sorry. Got it. Here, please. Hey, I'm Rico Moore, I'm a freelance journalist here in Colorado. Mr. Penley, I have a question for you. Um, in 2007, fundraising letter cited in a CNN report, you wrote that illegal immigration is spreading like a cancer. Um, it cited Tom Tancredo, who, according to a Think Progress report, demonized illegal immigrants as violent gangsters and, quote, jihadist terrorists. Um, I'm wondering if you still believe, if you stand by those statements, and if you still believe that Latino immigrants are spreading like a cancer, and what do you believe are the impacts, sir? Uh my personal opinions are irrelevant. I have a new job now. Uh, I'm a zealous advocate for my client. My client's the American people, and my boss is the President of the United States and Secretary Bernhardt. So what I thought, what I wrote, what I did in the past is irrelevant. Uh, I have orders, I have laws to obey, and I intend to do that. You earlier cited an opinion, sir, um, but, but you're not going to opine on this subject, I, I take it. Thank you. Let's move on to the next question. Hi, my name's Antonia Juhas, and I'm a Scripps Fellow at the Center for Environmental Journalism at the University of Colorado in Boulder. My question's for Mr. Penley, but I encourage anyone else to answer who'd like to. Um, the, under the Trump administration, the amount of public lands that have been open to oil and gas development has increased by six times. And you've spoken quite at length today about the desire to open more lands to oil and gas and coal development. My question is, is there a limit? And if there is, what is it? How much of public land should be open to oil, gas, and coal? And how do you set what that limit should be? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting question, and, and it really calls for some speculation. Uh, what we have is a multiple use mandate. Uh, we're operating under the Federal Land Policy and Management Act, the Mineral Leasing Act, and the National Environmental Policy Act, and all these other statutes. We have to go through a, a Lengthy, uh, I think the professor already said every time we do an RMP, a resource management plan, it takes us five years to get them complete. And at, during the preparation of that uh, resource management plan, we say, well, this is an area that people like for potential oil and gas uh, development, and how does it balance with endangered species or climate change or backpacking or access or recreational activities? And so it's really a, a, a not um, a kind of a global decision. It's a, a RMP by RMP decision, and at the end of the day, uh, uh, in response to public comments and the completion of our NEPA documents. So I, I really can't 
give you a better answer than that. I'm the, sorry. The administration has greatly fast-tracked that process to try and move rapidly over public comment period, legal review processes, and through that rapid escalation of that process has led to this rapid increase in the land being made uh, open to oil, gas, and coal. So I guess my question is, do you have a sense of there, there should be a limit, or rather, if there aren't impediments that you run into, should all of it be made open to achieve energy dominance? Well, you're asking a question that goes to the whole NEPA question. And I believe that NEPA is essentially where uh, projects go to die. I mean, we, we have an obligation to do NEPA, but the American public has, has, deserves an answer. It deserves a timely answer. In other words, should we, do an, should we be doing an EIS on one project for 10 years or five years or three years? How long should it take? Secretary Bernhardt came in and said, let's cut the time it takes to get these things done so people have answers. So people have some certainty that we were talking about earlier. And let's write documents that people will really read. Uh, I was in one meeting where we were looking at an EIS, 3, 000, uh, 300 pages long. The first time it was written, it was 3,000 pages long. You're not gonna read a 3,000 page document. No one's going to do that. Let's make a 300 page document that has all the facts so we can make a decision. And I think that that's what we need. We need that certainty. And so that's the improvement in the NEPA process. Uh, but as far, as far as setting a limit, setting a, a, a no more than this, uh, Congress will do that. That's Congress's obligation. If there's, and the President of the United States has said, let's develop energy on federal lands. The Secretary said, let's develop energy on federal lands. And me at the BLM and, and my predecessors are doing that very thing in accordance with law. Um, Thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Freemeth, and then I would like to get some other members of the panel to yeah, comment. Yeah, real quick. My dissertation here was on threats to parks from outside. I turned it into a book on external threats, and I studied the tar sands area in, near Canyonlands, Arches, and other areas. That issue's back. It's a huge issue. I will give the Secretary credit for withdrawing leases near Chaco Canyon, but where and when is the question here? Um, and Mr. Loper, would you comment on that? Is, is it your understanding that the, I mean, obviously administrations make all the time, decisions all the time of what's off limit, what's not. Do you see Congress as the main arbiter in when we say there will not be energy exploration on public lands? Is that, is that your view of it? I, I mean, Congress being the arbiter is always the ideal situation because they're the ones writing the statute and they're all uh, elected. Right, but uh, given the world that we live in right now, how, how has this played out in practice? You know, I, I think uh, the director referenced it. There, are, there are, are multiple processes, and I hate to make the process argument because it's so boring, but there is a resource management that goes, plan that goes into guiding where development happens, how it happens, when it occurs. On top of that, the lease sale has a environmental assessment as well. Um, you have multiple, you have areas of critical environmental concern that are areas you're not going to touch. You have, you have monuments that have been designated that you're not going to touch. You have, you have multiple different statuses of land where you're not going to have development uh, or you're not going to have a lease sale or, or a, as the director said, sometimes, you know, the governor would weigh in. We're not going to have, we don't want that there. So, you know, I, I think, is there a, I, I guess there's just a, process to make these decisions and make these determinations with, with public input. Uh, and if, if Congress is weighing in and withdrawing, you know, there, there's 109 million acres of, of wilderness uh, that have been formally withdrawn from Congress. I believe I have that correct. So, you know, ultimately Congress making that determination is absolutely best, but there's also a, a public process, a very public process that it takes a lot of input in, in where and when leasing occurs. Great. We're going to Question, please. Hi, uh, Jason Salzman, Colorado Times recorder. You wrote, uh, Secretary uh, Penley, that or Acting Secretary, that uh, the uh, the founders there, there's a constitutional duty to sell public lands, and the founders want this. You wrote that in 2016. That may be a personal opinion, I understand, <laughs> but how do you still believe that, and how does it affect your job now? Well, I didn't say that there's a constitutional duty to sell the land. Uh, what I did say was the property clause, which is in Article 4, gives all that power to Congress. Uh, I also said that the founders intended to sell all the lands, uh, but things changed. Times changed. Uh, Congress 
pass the National Park uh, Act in 1910. Uh, we passed, the Congress passed in 1977 the BLM Organic Act, the Federal Land Policy Management Act, in which it said, we have come to an end of the disposal era. We are no longer selling our federal lands. We are holding on to them. In other words, times change. I was talking about the past. But once again, uh, those views that I expressed then, uh, that was then, this is now, uh, my, my personal opinions on, in that regard are irrelevant. Uh, the administration has been crystal clear. The President of the United States, Secretary of the Interior, crystal clear. We do not believe in, we will not participate in the wholesale disposal or transfer of federal lands. Great. Bottom line. Let's move to the next question. Hi. Uh, my name is Emily Gertz. I'm an independent reporter. Um, um, Mr. Penley, um, the uh, Final environmental impact statement for drilling in the Arctic Refuge has been released uh, since you became the uh, de facto chief of BLM. And um, within Interior, the Fish and Wildlife Service has formally said that that uh, assessment process overlooked dozens of potential impacts, uh, negative impacts to uh, wildlife uh, if drilling commences in the coastal plain. Uh, what's BLM's plan? to address those deficiencies? It, I, it's not my understanding that the Fish and Wildlife Service and its biological opinion reached that conclusion. Uh, so I, I'm sorry, I disagree with the premise of your statement. And just as a follow-up, um, the Gwich'in people have said publicly and often that they, who rely heavily on the caribou, uh, who uh, breed on the coastal plain have not been respected or consulted by Interior and by BLM in, the, in this process. Um, do you have any plans to do additional consultation with the Gwich'in? We defer to our state directors, and it's my understanding that the state director has consulted early and often uh, with the, the folks there, especially those who depend on uh, subsistence uh, activities uh, for their survival. Uh, just, I wondered if anyone else on the panel would like to follow well, yeah, up. I, exactly. Would anyone want to weigh in? I'm interested in, in both if people have opinions on, obviously, this, this question of, of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, and also, anyway, I, I'll have a specific one for Mr. Lover, but go ahead. This it's brings up an, uh, a question, a burning question that I have for the acting director, and this is about the, the tension between consultation and consent um, with tribal nations. Um, we Federal law mandates... Uh, that the federal government consults meaningfully with tribal nations in their, in their um, development projects that affect tribal and treaty lands. Um, and that, that consultation can be um, as little as a letter is sent to a tribal government. On the other hand, we have something called the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People that um, is very clear on um, endorsing the free prior and informed consent, consent of um, tribal nations in these kinds of development projects, which the Obama administration endorsed in 2010, with the, uh, the United States being the last country in the world to endorse this declaration. Now, we have this on, um, it, you know, in, our, um, in our country that we endorse cons con uh, consent. Um, so I'm wondering, like, how does the administration, how do you think about the difference between consultation and consent? Well, I defer to uh, Assistant Secretary Tara Sweeney, uh, who is an Alaska native and the first Alaska native to be Assistant Secretary at the Department of the Interior uh, for Indian Affairs. Uh, and she has advised me and she advised the chairman of the House Natural Resources Committee uh, that with regard to uh, multiple activities she engages in consultation often, uh, and in fact specifically with regard to reorganization activities, had 18 separate consultation uh, episodes and events. I mean, we're directed under federal law uh, to consult, and we do consult, and we uh, aggressively use the services of uh, Assistant Secretary Sweeney to do so. Okay. Hi, Lisa Friedman from the New York Times. Thanks so much for doing this panel today. This has been great. Um, I also have a question for Director Penley. Uh, and again, a personal opinion question, perhaps, from your, your past. But um, you've said today you know, that uh, what Secretary Bernhardt has said about climate change, you've noted that you have not 
been personally briefed on a few climate change issues, but you have been clear in the past on Twitter and elsewhere that you don't think that climate change exists. Um, I'm hoping that you could clarify for us first, what did you mean by that? What don't you think exists? Is it you don't think greenhouse gases are warming the earth? Um, is it something else? What scientists you rely on for those conclusions? And if, if the answer in part is that this is your personal opinion, maybe you could explain to us some concrete things that you, you think you've done to uh, help inform or discuss this issue and, and ensure that personal opinions um, you know, are, are, are not at play in making policy decisions? Uh, nope, not gonna clarify. Uh, those are my personal opinions. Uh, the Secretary staked out the position. I'm a Marine, I follow orders. Uh, he's told me the way it's gonna be and that's the way it's gonna be. Okay, over there. Hi, uh, my name is Jenny Lay. I'm an independent reporter based in Western Colorado. Um, and Director Penley, you've talked pretty emphatically about um, who's affected and their voices. Um, the BLM Resource Advisory Councils have a history of providing very helpful and diverse input to the BLM. Um, and these councils are composed of bipartisan groups of representatives that have met regularly to discuss and manage land issues. Uh, and provide valuable feedback to the BLM. Uh, yet we've seen the racks gutted or prevented from meeting altogether during this administration. The Rocky Mountain rack is down to two, mem two members, uh, both of which are set to expire in December of this year. And the Northwest rack right there in my neighborhood uh, has at least f six vacancies that aren't being filled, uh, four of which are set to expire in November. Um, so why is this? Uh, great question. Um, and I met, I met with our uh, state director for Colorado here uh, yesterday on this very topic. It was one of many topics she brought up. Uh, she's had a number of nominations sent up. I have already signed them off on them and sent them up to the secretary. And she said, where are they, Perry? And I said, heck if I know, but I'll sure find out. Uh, one of the things that I've run into is, uh, I'm sorry, this is really inside baseball, but it's a a good question. Uh, we There are rules and regulations that govern how racks are, are, are set forth. And there is a department guidance on how we do this in departmental rules and regulations. And every other agency in the department uses those government, those department rules. The only exception is the Bureau of Land Management. We have our own set of rules that go back to 1981 and they're very burdensome and complex. And I said, let's get rid of these old rules and let's use what the department does so we can move expeditiously on the issues you want. Because I want to do what you want, which is I'd like to staff those racks simply because you're absolutely right. They provide contributions and uh, information from people on the land uh, who can give us information that we need. So I'm, I'm with you on that. I'm frustrated too, but we're going to try to do better and get that, get that complete. Thank you. Does anyone want to comment on that? The, these uh, advisory councils have been, you know, they were initially suspended by Secretary Zinke. They've basically been, you know, many of them have, have been, have been, I don't know, have disempowered under, you know, in recent years. Is there anything that some, anyone else wants to say about that? They are great examples of collaboration. And if that's what you believe in terms of local involvement from different points of view, they're not just resource developers one would want to accelerate their use if you're, bel if you're a believer in that. Got it, next question. Um, my name is Amy Martin. I make a podcast called Threshold. I'm based in Montana. And I have a question for you as well, Mr. Penley. Um, I just want to try to clarify uh, what feels like a discrepancy. Um, you've said that Secretary Bernhardt is saying that climate change is real and that it is human caused. Um, in the response to the comments on the draft EIS on the uh, leasing program for the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, the BM re BLM responded to comments, concerns about climate change, saying there is no climate crisis. So which is it? Is there a climate crisis? Is it human caused or not? Yeah, I read that comment too. Um, uh, but that does not overwhelm the hundreds and hundreds of pages that were spent discussing in a very real scientific way that issue. 
Uh, but it does I, speak I, to the discrepancy that we're trying to solve here. So, because I agree, there's lots of talk about climate change in that draft EIS. That's right. But that comment undermines everything that that said. So, which one is it? I don't it? think it undermines it at all. It's, it, what is it? Two sentences? Uh, it's Two repeated sentences multiple overwhelms times, hundreds actually. of pages? I disagree. Right. And when we make a decision on that, uh, I can tell you what will guide our opinion and our decision, it won't be those two sentences, it'll be hundreds of pages spent on it and a hard look at that issue. So, uh, and once again, the Secretary's uh, position on this subject is crystal clear to me, I get it, and uh, that's my position too. And just to follow up on that, did obviously, again, there are multiple outlets that reported that, you know, that, that comment, did, did you get a sense of how those comments, how that, those specific lines got into the EIS? Because they are, as you mentioned, a sharp contrast to say, projections that are in there about the extent to, for example, how bird populations, many of them, if they are, are, are gonna, you know, face extinction because of climate change impacts over, you know, the, uh, the, twin, the 2100 horizon. You know, how did, how did those lines get in there? It's my understanding that was a contractor put it in and the contractor based on uh, not really looking globally, uh, but looking specifically at uh, basically the local area and saying whether or not the decision would be disastrous to the local area rather than looking in a, in a broader context. And I, I appreciate you saying what you said, that, that it stands in stark contrast to the hundreds of pages that we have already. Next question over there. Yeah, I'm Christy Georgia. I'm an independent journalist in Oregon. And uh, a couple of hours south of Portland where I live on the campus of the University of Oregon, um, a, a movement started in, uh, that is, is now a legal case called Juliana. Uh, in it, the plaintiffs who are young people are charging that uh, the activities and fossil fuels that drive climate change uh, that are subsidized by the US government deny them and future generations life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness. So I'm curious, Director Pendley and others, um, but as a lawyer, not as personal opinion, what's your view of that constitutional argument? Well, I've been instructed not to play a lawyer. Um, but if I were a lawyer, uh, <laughs> I'd question whether or not people making a claim like that had constitutional standing, Article Three standing, and whether or not their claims were remote and speculative. But I'll leave it to court to make that decision. and attorneys with the Department of Justice or whoever gets sued on it to make that, uh, make that determination and argue about it. But that's, that's a free opinion. Does anyone else on the panel want to weigh into the question of, you know, for example, do young people have, have the right to challenge in court the federal government's decisions as they impact greenhouse gases? All right, everyone's passing. We'll go on to the next question. Okay. Hi, my name is Judith Kohler. I'm with the Denver Post. And um, this is for Mr. Penley. Um, there's been a lot of discussion with the move of the BLM to the West about um, wanting to be closer to the communities of people who are impacted by the decisions. Yet what we've seen over the past couple of years is more concerned voice that more voice concerned, uh, I'm sorry, more concerns voiced that a lot of the decision making is actually being centralized and they point to things like the public comment periods being shortened, the, some policies like master leasing plans being rolled back here in Colorado. Many years were put in to work on master leasing plans in the South and North Park areas of Colorado. And just recently, the Uncompagre um, resource management plan was released with a preferred alternative that was not part of a years long process. So my question to you is what are you going to do to ensure that public voices are indeed heard on public um, decisions on public lands. Well, that's exactly why the Secretary of the Interior, David Bernhardt, wants to move our top people in Washington uh, out to the West. Uh, our top executives, when I talk executives, I mean the Senior Executive Service, our GS-15s, our GS-14s, 50 and 60 percent of them are in Washington, D.C. 97 percent of our employees are out West, but the, the decision makers are in Washington, that's where it's centralized. And I'm afraid they're out of touch with what's going on on the land. And so our desire, what we have done, 
is we have transferred 74 positions from Washington to the various state offices to do uh, state functions, and then 222 positions that do headquarters works in Washington, they're moving out to the states uh, to, to do uh, headquarters works in the states. And I think what it's going to do is allow us to be closer to the people, closer to the ground, uh, we'll be able to make earlier, better informed decisions uh, based on the realities on the ground. And so I think your fears of a centralization are misplaced, and I think they will be further uh, well, well, with all, with all due respect, we have seen a rolling back of public um, comment period times. We have seen a rolling back of certain um, policies that were meant to be ground up. So my question, is that going to change now? if people are moving from D.C. to the West? Well, I disagree with your premise. Uh, your premise is that there's some centralization and that we're frustrating I the ability of the I think that is what people think. Do you want to ask a question and get it answered, or do you want to keep talking? At this point, go, go ahead. <laughs> I'm answering answer your answer question. The question then we're moving on. Uh, we're, we are allowing public comments. Uh, I mean, the bottom line is, uh, I've been in this business a long time of dealing with protests and litigation. And the bottom line, at the end of the day, everybody knows who's going to file a protest. We all know. And the fact that we ask for the protest to be filed in a more timely way so we can move forward and make a decision that benefits everybody, I think that's all good news. And so uh, I do believe uh, that we're going to have better decisions, informed decisions. Here's what I hear from congressmen, from governors, from tribal leaders, uh, from elected officials, from stakeholders, and from neighbors in the West. You don't have enough people out here. You don't have enough resources to do the job. You need more leaders out here so we can make our case heard. You know, it's, one, it's a bit, no big deal for me to jump on a plane and fly into Denver. It's a big deal for three county commissioners to get on a plane to go to Washington, go to the secretary, say, Mr. Secretary, this decision you're making, it's a bad one. I wish you'd made a better decision when it was back at the state. And Professor we hope Freeman. to solve that problem. Professor Prima. You guys are interested in covering this story. Talk to the Public Lands Foundation. They are 700 retired BLM employees who ran the agencies, were oil and gas people, wilderness people. I sat next to their head in the hearing. They are opposed to this. That tells you something, that diverse BLM retirees are opposed to the move. Not of all the people, to be fair, but their insights are very important talk to them, and I can tell you who they are. They're, they're neutral in all this. Let's move on to the next question. Thank you so much. Go ahead. Hi, John Platt, editor of The Revelator. Uh, Acting Director Pendley, you've mentioned your state directors a number of times, and you've also said that they have not briefed you yet on climate change effects in their local regions. Are you expecting those briefings, and are there other topics that you have not yet been briefed on? Well, yeah, there's a ton of topics I haven't been briefed on, and one of the reasons is my recusals. Uh, we have a very rigorous ethics procedure at the department. The second meeting I went to on my very first day, I spent an hour with an ethics attorney so that she could brief me on the things I could do and couldn't do. I have a screener who screens all my meetings. Uh, everything that's possibly on my schedule uh, runs through the ethics office. So there's a whole ton of things that, uh, that I've just recently been cleared to, to be briefed on, and so I'm eager to hear those, including uh, presentations on uh, the climate change issue you bring up. Okay, so you're expecting stuff soon. Sir? You're expecting stuff soon to be briefed. Ish. When it, when it pops up on my, on my schedule. Okay. Okay, moving on to the next thing. So much. We have, I want to get as many questions because we're running out of time. Go ahead. Thanks. Hi, I'm Brian Calvert. I'm the editor-in-chief of High Country News. Um, actually, I have a question for uh, Ms. Uh, Giulio Whitaker. Um, Given that you're sort of talking about the legal structures and their problems that, that come about from um, the colonial settler sort of legal structures and those problems, um, and given the fact that there are a lot of communities that do, uh, native communities that live around the public lands, um, and given the, and just to fact check, the, the mining is not the lifeblood of a lot of rural communities. It's actually services and a lot of other things. But I, um, I want to know from your point of view, if you see the public lands and federal policy as a means to which we can start to move a conversation <laughs> forward in terms of indigenous rights, or if you think that we have to move away from law or, or change laws, C can the system be used now to move a conversation forward? That's always a million dollar question, and I think that, <clears throat> I think that the answer is yes and no. I think we have to use all kinds of tools available to us. 
Um, and, and I think ultimately we have to dismantle the system as it is. Um, the federal, federal Indian law is a system that's based on um, a, an idea of European superiority over indigenous peoples, and it's not even racial superiority. This is beyond race. This is about religious superiority. That's how um, the Doctrine of Discovery was written. This is the first Indian law case that was ever argued in this country. It was about um, religious European Christian superiority over indigenous peoples, and this is the foundation of federal Indian law today, and so everything has built upon it um, from there. Um, so, I, but to, to go to the question about how can law and the system be used in these positive ways, um, to the administration's credit, last year the, BL, the, the administration did, did return something like th uh, 30,000 acres of land to tribes in Oregon of BLM land. And I think that was a really good move. Um, given that 48% of the land in the western 48 states is public lands, why not give some of that land back? Why can't we talk about that? Um, those indigenous peoples are better managers of land anyway. So why not um, give them priority in, in these ways and, and use this as a way to, um, to bring restoration of justice in some way? Okay, I, we're running out of time. We're going to take one last question so everybody else can sit down. Um, and I would encourage folks that land transfer uh, that, um, that the professor just mentioned um, was actually covered in High Country News. Um, uh, and I encourage people to read that story. And let's have our last question right over there. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Alistair Bitsoy. I'm the Communications Director for Utah not, um, Diné Pikea, the nonprofit organization that designated successfully Bears Ears National Monument. But I'm also a freelance reporter as well, and just following up to Dino's question to um, Mr. Pinley here, um, indigenous consent was given to um, the establishment of Bears Ears National Monument, and my question to you is when, are you, when is the federal agency gonna finally or officially listen to indigenous peoples who are stakeholders to public lands and are protecting public lands for all of everyone here today? It I'm sorry, I'm recused on that issue, so I, I'm not able to answer it. Okay, sorry. We're, we're gonna, I'm gonna, I had said that I would do, give a very brief pop quiz, the final question to our panelists. Here's my question. Hopefully you're prepared. Um, what is the biggest challenge to public lands that we are failing to address and why? Starting with Mr. Fosberg, moving down the line. Well, I think it's probably climate change overall. It impacts every single acre of public lands, be it in Alaska or Maine or Florida. And until we can get our you know, hands around that, it impacts everything else we're dealing with, invasive species, access, you name it. I'm going to read one sentence from Cecil Andrus's biography that nails this to me. The West is too precious to be used as a scorch earth, all or nothing battleground. That's the threat that will we'll destroy each other fighting over this. Thank you. Mr. Loper. Yeah, I, I would kind of echo John's sentiments. Uh, consensus is so important uh, to public lands management, and we have to listen to each other, and we have to respect each other in this process. Uh, and I think that's that's so important to addressing any issue, whether climate, whether whether tribal uh, issues. So, I'll I'll get really in the weeds. Uh, I think the biggest issue I see is the wild horse and burrow issue. Uh, we have 88,000 wild horses and burros on our western federal lands, uh, and they are causing havoc on the lands. Uh, we have a BLM report that came to my office, written by people who've worked on this issue for decades, and they say some land in the west is so devastated and destroyed it will never recover. Never recover. Uh, that's a long darn time, and we've got to do something about it. Uh, we are trying to work with Congress and with uh, various groups, the animal welfare groups, the people who use the ra lands, the ranchers, the cattlemen, uh, local people, to try to solve this problem. We've increased our, uh, our uh, adoption program uh, to get people to adopt these wild animals, uh, but that's not going to solve the problem. And it's a tens of millions of dollars problem, but the more important thing for me as the manager of those lands is the existential threat to the quality of those lands. Professor Julia Whitaker. 
Climate change is definitely, the, I think, the biggest concern for indigenous peoples. It's also the access to and protection of sacred sites, which, um, as I've already talked about, is, is um, a huge problem in federal Indian law. But also, um, uh, to uh, Acting Director Penley's um, last comments, I think, you know, engage tribal, tribal people more thoroughly with land management techniques. It's indigenous knowledge that is really the definition of sustainability. People who have lived on the land from time immemorial and who lived here um, without destroying it for thousands of years, I think they know some things. So use that knowledge. I want the audience to join me in thanking this really talented panel for taking notes. And join Josh and me in thanking Juliet for this fabulous panel. Thank you.